When Galileo pronounced that the Earth was not the center of the universe, it flew in the face of conventional beliefs. But he questioned that thesis. He doubted. And it is those doubts that Alan Bernstein says lead us to some of our greatest scientific advances. Let's find out more. Here's Dr. Alan Bernstein, the president and CEO of CIFAR, the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research. It's good to have you in that chair here at TVO. It's nice to be here. Well, I want to start from doubt. Doubt from the outset. The first scientific society, the Royal Society, formed in Britain, 17th century, has as its motto, nullius in verbum. And for those who didn't take grade nine Latin, take no one's word for it. Why do you think that was an important choice of motto? Well, you know, it's really interesting. If you think of that motto, um, here's a group of distinguished scientists, people like Isaac Newton, who came together to form the first scientific society. You would think they would have some uplifting motto, you know, truth, uh, search for the truth, some, something along those lines. And yet they had this almost cynical kind of model, take no one's word for it. So I think that's the clue is to look at the context of the times that they were living in. And the times they were living in, which was the mid-1600s, was a time when the monarch and the church ruled. Uh, and they, they ruled. And what, what these gentlemen, they were all men, mm -hmm. were saying when they came together was that science or evidence should trump ideology and, and dogma. Uh, take no one's word for it. And so they were really throwing down a gauntlet. And how did those who had the gauntlet thrown at them react to that? Well, I don't know that the, that the, you know, the king issued the charter for the Royal Society, so I don't think he realized the implications of what he was doing. But, but the consequence was certainly that from that moment on, science just took off in the West, in Western society, particularly in Britain and, and in Europe. It just flourished. Uh, and I think there was this appetite among some people for questioning, for, for investigating the world using scientific methods. It really unleashed the floodgate. I'm sure a lot of our viewers have heard of the Massey Lecture. You did something called the Massey Talk on Science and Society, and the title you chose was, kind of similar, Doubt Everything. Mm -hmm. And in it you wrote, the Greeks had a pride and confidence in human potential combined with a competitive drive to excel. They also had an insatiable curiosity about the world. And for those lucky enough to be male and full citizens, they enjoyed the fruits of a fierce belief in democracy, freedom of thought, and critical discussion essential nutrients for science to flourish. Uh, you probably know where I'm going with this, but given the complaints that scientists have made about the now departed Harper government, uh, would you say that we're actually providing enough quote unquote nutrients for science in Canada currently? Well, there's two kinds of nutrients, I think. One is money. You need, you need funds to do research, and I'll come back to that. But the other is, I think, intrinsic to science is an openness and transparency. One of the first things I learned when I was getting my PhD from my PhD supervisor was you haven't finished doing an experiment until you've published your work, until you've shared your work with colleagues, with peers, anywhere in the world. And have them... And have them judge it. Judge it, okay. Okay, and so it's... You, I can't imagine a scientist, for example, saying, I have found a cure for cancer, uh, for example, but I'm not going to tell you how I did it or what I did. That's right. not science. Right. So science is all about openness and transparency. And so uh, I think intrinsic to, to science is this freedom to speak. And it's not just about freedom. It's really about critiquing uh, one other's work. And so I think as a taxpayer, if we're going to fund, for example, government scientists, we should expect them, we should want them to share their research with their colleagues and with us. You confident if, that's going to happen now? Oh, I hope so. I mean, Mr. Trudeau has signaled in indirectly that he will do that. We'll find out in the weeks and days to come. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think one would want that to happen because that's the, that's the quality control that they're actually doing good science. Now, you also said money is part of the nutrient as well. Well, so, so money's part of it as well. And so, you know, young people, uh, science without young people, I've also said in, my, in, my, in that address that, uh, that science without young people is dead science. And at the moment, it's very difficult for young people at Canadian universities to get funding to do research. And so I worry that the best young people are going to choose careers elsewhere. And as so in not in science or not in, in Canada? As, as in not in science or not in Canada, exactly. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think we have a, uh, having built up over the last 
10 to 20 years, a very strong kind of infrastructure for doing science, we risk literally throwing the baby out with the bathwater by not encouraging young people hmm. to do science, giving them the oxygen to breathe to do science. Here's another excerpt from your talk. It is also a time when science is misunderstood and distrusted. From climate change to the safety of vaccines, fluoridation of water, genetically modified foods, evolution, and on and on. Well, let's take one of your examples. Your premise that doubt is essential. Should we not doubt the safety, for example, of genetically modified foods? So uh, it, it's about evidence. Mm -hmm. um, and so in the case of genetically modified foods or vaccines or any of the other examples that you, you read from my, from my talk, Steve, um, there is a lot of evidence um, that, that GMOs, for example, are safe. Genetically modified organisms. Genetically modified organisms. And indeed, if you think about agriculture um, over the last thousand years, agriculture is a history of domestication of, a net of wild animals and wild crops. And what farmers have been doing for hundreds of years is breeding these uh, animals and crops so that they could be domesticated and farmed. With GMOs, with genetically modified organisms, what we're doing is actually much more precise and much less intrusive, which is just inserting one gene at a time as opposed to a breeding where you don't know which genes are going to be scrambled where. Um, and there's been lots of tests. I think the, the mistake in the case of GMOs that was made, unfortunately, was that the manufacturers, the, the companies, companies like Monsanto, insisted that the products not be labeled as genetically modified organisms. Which started a whole debate about are they being secret and blah, Exactly. Blah, blah, blah. When yeah. you want to hide something, it implies you have something to hide. <laughs> I, I would have actually done exactly the opposite. I would have said it's an opportunity for classrooms to come to the grocery store mm -hmm. and learn from a scientist from Monsanto what did they actually do and why is that tomato that's been genetically modified better than one that hasn't been. Mm. Uh, and so I think that was a, was a PR mistake of the first order. One more passage from your talk here. Uh, the other source of antipathy and hostility to science derives from the feeling that it has somehow robbed us of beauty, mystery, and spirituality. As Walt Whitman wrote in his poem, When I Heard the Learned Astronomer, we might find ourselves tired and sick of the figures, charts, and diagrams of astronomy, and yearn only to look up, quote, in perfect silence at the stars. For me, science does not remove mystery and beauty from our world, but rather adds to it. Okay, let's take you at your point on, uh, on that, but go one step beyond. What about spirituality? One of the things that science is often accused of doing is sort of stealing spirituality from us or denying that spirituality can exist. Yes. Um, how come it's not on your list? Well, I, I actually don't see it that way. I think science has a certain sphere that helps us understand the world around us. It, it is, in my judgment, the most powerful way that humanity has come up with to understand the world around us. But science says nothing about um, our grief when someone we love dies. Uh, so science says nothing about the importance of friendships or our loved ones, um, about our sense of self-worth. So there is room for spirituality and faith yeah, there. Yeah, we are all complex human beings. There's many layers of, of that which we, in which we operate. And so I, I'm not at all suggesting in that talk that you're reading so well that, um, that we only should have one way, one lens at looking at the, the world around us. And so, uh, uh, and, and if you think about, and the example that I give in the talk is if, if you think about the birth of a newborn baby, it's, it's, if the baby's healthy, it's a wonderful event, absolutely a wonderful event. And so when I've gone to see, uh, you know, a newborn baby, when my daughter gave birth or a friend or a relative has given birth, it's, it's just wonderful. You listen to the baby cry, the mom's okay, and it's, you know, it's, it's heartwarming. Uh, but as a scientist, as a biologist, I am also acutely aware of the latest science about embryological development and how that baby developed. Hmm. And it's, it, to me, is a true miracle uh, that the, the thousands of genes and proteins and cells that have to interact in that developing embryo to give rise to a healthy human being actually happens correctly most of the time. So I think I have an additional layer of understanding of appreciation because I'm a scientist. I don't think it takes away from my appreciation of that baby simply as a newborn baby. I think it actually adds to it. No inc incompatibility, therefore, between religion and science? 
I didn't say that. Okay. Um, uh, I'm talking about my emotions when I see a newborn baby. Okay. Um, uh, and there are some scientists. But who, some people just sorry, sorry to interrupt. But you know, there's some people. That, what's the first thing people do when the baby comes out and it's got ten fingers and ten toes? They look to the heavens and they say, "Thank you, God." Okay. Now, you yeah. might not do that. An evolutionary biologist might not do that. That's so right. is there an incompatibility, therefore, between that moment you just described and religiosity? Yeah, so I think that's a question of personal belief. There are some scientists, Francis Collins, who's the director of the National Institutes of Health in the US. So he oversees a $30 billion biomedical research. Don't enterprise. you wish you had that money? I absolutely <laughs> do. Uh, uh, Francis does not see an incompatibility between religion and his science. Um, others do. Um, uh, I actually don't tend to think about it that much, um, mostly because I don't think it's an important question. I think it's a, r religion is by definition a belief question. You either believe it or you don't, and you can't argue a belief. It's either there or it isn't, uh, and science is over here. Science mm -hmm. is about evidence. And so I don't think it's something that one can have a general argument about. F for me, uh, since I'm not religious, uh, I tend to look at the world through the lens of a scientist. Uh, and the spiritual th things that we talked about uh, before. Uh, so, uh, and I know a lot of people would say they're incompatible. It's illogical to believe in evolution and also believe that God created the earth in seven days. Uh, but again, there are a lot of people who are religious who don't read the Bible literally mm -hmm. and take that as a metaphor that God created the earth. God, one could argue, is a word uh, where we would substitute the driving forces of evolution and natural selection. So there's ways around it, but I, I just I find it less interesting than the mysteries of science. You have doubts about the veracity of God? That's what the program's about. It's about well, doubts, so maybe you have doubts on that. Well, I think, no, because I think belief in God is simply a belief. Right, I get you. Let's, uh, let's finish up on this. Earlier in the program, Arthur MacDonald, whom you know well, said the neutrino experiments that won him this year's Nobel Prize were, quote, very conclusive, had a 100 million to one likelihood of being correct. You can't say absolutely positively, but he said it's 100 million to one that he's right. How important is that little bit of doubt, that one scintilla of a chance that maybe he's wrong? Right, so before I answer your question, I think as Canadians, we should all be really proud that a Canadian, Art McDonald, won the Nobel Prize mm -hmm. in Physics. I think it's, a, it's fantastic for art, of course, mm -hmm. but I think it's also fantastic for Canada. It's a gold medal uh, uh, in science. Um, and I'm particularly proud because Art is uh, a CIFAR Associate Fellow. Mm -hmm. uh, he was on the CIFAR President's Research Council for many years, so he has a strong and long association with my organization. To answer your question, mm -hmm. um, Think about Newton, and I can't predict what will happen in the future with, with Art McDonald science, whether it will be proved right or wrong, you know, 100 years from now. Newton's law of physics, laws of physics and motion, were actually shown to be um, not wrong, but a special case of a much broader set of laws when Einstein came along, uh, but 300 years later. That doesn't mean that what Newton did wasn't useful and was a, wasn't an amazing contribution to science. Uh, it, it was, it, for his time. For his time. Um, and indeed, much of what we do in everyday life depends critically on Newton's laws of physics. Yeah, but last I checked, that apple falling out of the tree is still going to hit you on the head. And, and gravity is still a force. Yep. Uh, but what Einstein showed was that actually at high, very high speeds, approaching the speed of light, Newton's laws don't hold, hmm. for example. And so was Newton wrong? Again, that's not really how science thinks about it. What he did was absolutely correct in terms of explaining the world as we know it. Einstein came along and said, gee, that's a special case of relativistic mechanics. Hmm. So I, I think that's, that's where I think science has this great power, this great drive by doubting, by always questioning, even Newton, questioning Newton himself, the father of modern science. Einstein came along and said, actually, Newton was you know, OK, but we've got to think down the 20th century. Uh, so I think that is the power of science, of, of reinventing itself, of constantly reshaping itself in light of new data, of new evidence. Gotcha. Dr. Bernstein, thanks so much for coming in tonight. My pleasure. Alan Bernstein from CIFAR. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.